coming up, a major step towards a replacement for 100 low lead avgas, some extreme fun in the extreme decathlon, Dr. Jonathan Sack here on treating depression, and the other voices in your head. The AOPA Live this week begins in just a moment. giant step towards replacing leaded aviation gasoline. Hello everyone, I'm Warren Morningstar. Tom Haynes is taking a well-deserved break. Thanks for watching AOPA Live this week. Well, this week the FAA asked fuel producers to submit possible replacement fuels for 100 low lead. The significance is that unlike in the past where we spent considerable time researching potential drop-in replacement fuels and looking at different fuel combinations, different chemical components and the like, this program takes candidate fuels, so specific fuels that candidates are bringing forward, and determines their impact on the existing fleet, the production and distribution, environmental concerns and economic considerations, and generates the data needed to approve those fuels in the aircraft. So we're moving from a research program into what effectively is a qualification and certification program. Well, that program was developed by an industry and government committee, AOPA was a member. The committee created the Fuel Development Roadmap to search for alternative fuels. An important recommendation was the creation of an FAA fuels program office to coordinate the various agency offices and testing activities at the FAA Technical Center in New Jersey. The center will test candidate fuels to determine how they would work in the existing fleet. They'll look at production and distribution, examine the fuel effects on the environment, and look at the economics of the candidate fuel. With this program in place, we're now adding certainty that we're taking into consideration the impact on those engines and those aircraft to minimize those, to keep them flying, to ensure that there's a path to keep them viable into the future. So now we're adding certainty into that. So today, with this program coming forward, I feel more certain that if I own an engine today that I needed to overhaul, or I was looking to buy an aircraft that relied on a high-octane fuel, that there is a path forward that is going to take into consideration the impact a new fuel will have on these aircraft and give me a path to ensure that I can keep that airplane flying in the future. The goal is to have a certification data package done by 2018, which would give fuel producers everything that they need to market a replacement fuel for 100 low lead. You can see more of the interview with Rob Hackman on AOPLive.org. But it's not just the issue of fuel. While general aviation faces numerous challenges, perhaps none are more daunting than our future power plants. Most engines we fly today were designed 70 years ago. Well, starting in the July issue of AOP Pilot Magazine, we'll begin an in-depth look at the trends and advancements in aviation propulsion, including some ways to make that old horizontally opposed air-cooled engine a model of efficiency. The digital edition of the July issue is available right now on your iPad. Well, the FAA moves forward on one thing, but then takes a giant shot at general aviation. This week we've learned more about the agency's ransom demand to EAA and AirVenture. The problem, the problem was they were very, um, very brazen in saying you have really two choices. You could either uh, elect not to have the show or pay us our costs and uh, we will then grant you the waivers necessary to be able to operate the, the convention. In a Skype interview earlier this week, Jack Pelton told me that EAA will find a way to pay the nearly half a million dollars the FAA is demanding, but that's going to hurt other EAA programs. This event for us as an association really provides the, a large portion of our revenue that allows us to uh, implement the programs throughout the year that are so critical for aviation education, whether it be Young Eagles or our Eagle programs or any of the scholarship and outreach activity. It gets funded through this event, but if everything goes as it you know, should go um, as planned, we'll be able to, to muscle our way through it. It just means throughout the rest of the year, we're going to have to cut back on some of our programming, which uh, is very, very unfortunate for what our mission is. 
Many in the aviation community are outraged by this, including 28 U.S. senators from both sides of the aisle, who sent a letter to FAA Administrator Michael Huerta urging the agency to provide air traffic control services at AirVenture and other major aviation events at no additional charge. The senator said the half million dollar charge to EAA was a user fee, and the law prohibits that. And there's no doubt in Pelton's mind that this is ultimately all about more user fees. And if you can just arbitrarily decide that you're going to start charging for uh, controllers' expenses in an event like this, why would that not mean that the FAA won't charge for services when you go into your local FISDO or your local certification office to get uh, services? There's, there's nothing that says that will, will not happen, and, and uh, that's a very, very ugly precedent to start. You can see my full interview with EAA boss Jack Pelton on AOPALive.org. Well, speaking of FAA services, it's now 13 days past the deadline, the deadline that Icon Aircraft founder Kirk Hawkins gave the FAA to respond to his request for a weight exemption for his A5 amphibious light sport aircraft. Nothing yet from the feds, but we'll keep checking. How do you take a good thing and make it even better? If you're American Champion Aircraft, you take it to the extreme. AOPA pilot senior editor Al Marsh has the story. What do you get when you add 30 more horsepower to one of the most popular aerobatic trainers in the world? You get the new Extreme Decathlon from American Champion. Best pilot and engineer Jody Bratt describes the new 210 horsepower model. So with the engine change, the engine is 40 pounds heavier than the, the, the standard 180 horsepower engine. Uh, we needed to make up that um, weight, so it was kind of an exercise in weight savings. Um, while we were at it, we added some performance. Changes were made to the wingtips and cabin floor to save weight. Brad describes the improvements. The ailerons add 33% uh, in roll rate, so approximately 90 degrees per second roll rate now. The airplane got a thumbs up from airshow pilot Greg Kuntz, who flew the extreme for photos in an upcoming article in AOPA Pilot. And it just really made a very nice airplane out, out of it. It uh, feels good. It's it, they're the symmetrical type of ailerons. So you add the power, the greater rate of roll, it really made a dynamite airplane. The 180 horsepower decathlon will continue in production along with the new Extreme. You can have one for $210,000. Al Marsh, AOPA Live. Yeah, that looks like a lot of fun, Al. You can read more about the Extreme Decathlon in the July issue of AOPA Pilot Magazine. Well, Tom is off this week. He's uh, in an undisclosed location. But last weekend, he joined a group of AOPA staff and other volunteers for a Learn to Fly Day here at the Frederick Airport. Folks had the chance to check out a variety of aircraft and get information on flying. There were activities for the kids, too. And best of all, free airplane rides. Uh, lots of kids and a couple of uh, young folks who are really interested in learning to fly after the experience and one, one uh, young man who is uh, now pleading with his mother for a discovery flight for his birthday where he actually can manipulate the controls and uh, count on his logbook. So lots, lots of good interest. It's a really fun experience. Some 216 kids and adults went for airplane rides, and as Tom mentioned, many followed up by signing up for a discovery flight at our local flight school. This is definitely something pilots could do at other airports. If you have the passion and the group of people willing to share this gift of flight and of showing off airplanes, it's, it's actually not so hard to put on. I mean, you've got airplanes, we know people want to come out and see them. You just spread the word and it's just a great event for the community. 
And it just so happens that AOPA has a handy guide on how to organize and promote an airport event or open house. You can find it on the new AOPA.org under the Advocacy tab. Go to Get Involved and the Airport Support Network. Then look in the Resource section under AOPA Guides. Well, from learning to fly to first to fly, not everyone agrees that the Wright brothers perfected controlled powered flight, including, it seems, Connecticut lawmakers. They've passed a bill granting official recognition of Gustav Whitehead as the first pilot to achieve powered flight. There's no conclusive proof of that other than some early newspaper reports. Whitehead never developed a commercially successful aircraft, and the Smithsonian insists the distinction of first powered flight belongs to the Wright brothers. You can't legislate history, said the Smithsonian. Well, coming up after the break, who's behind the voice in your head? And a very pretty place to fly. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're watching AOPA Live this week. Well, Waco Classic Aircraft has unveiled a new aerobatic biplane, the Great Lakes 2T-1A-2. This is an update of the 1929 design, and it includes metal wing spars, bigger cockpits, and other goodies. You can read more about it on the new AOPA.org. Just type Great Lakes Biplane in the search box. Well, Eclipse Aerospace announced an extended service life for both the Eclipse 500 and the 550 jets. 20,000 hours or 20,000 cycles, that's more than 50 years of service life. At the same time, Simcom Training Centers and Eclipse announced a new full motion Level D simulator. A pilot can get a single pilot Eclipse type rating using just that simulator. It includes the new Avio integrated flight management system. Well, flight management systems, and for that matter, many new autopilots and GPS systems, talk to you. At a critical moment, that voice in your head could save your life. Now, different avionics makers take different approaches to getting your attention, and some rely on real people to do the job. Jim Moore set out to find out who owns the voices in your headset. Garmin uses computers to synthesize oral alerts, while well, engineers at Rockwell Collins opted to record the real thing. On some Proline systems, you may find yourself being warned by the baritone of Marion, Iowa art dealer Craig Campbell. Terrain ahead, full stop. Terrain ahead, full stop. In a telephone call, Campbell said a lot of effort goes into getting this right. How many different ways can you say pull up in over 12 degrees of urgency? But they took this very seriously. We did this over and over and over and over until they were happy and then I think I think I'm out there on all kinds of planes giving various levels of warning now caution terrain caution terrain in Lincoln, Massachusetts, Avidine Vice President Steve Jacobson, who played a key role getting Kathleen Turner to voice alerts for the Air Force back in the 1990s, has recruited British voices for the company's various products. Samantha Hobson is British by birth and a town planner by training. Terrain ahead. Pull up. Terrain. Terrain. Pull up. Terrain. Pull up. Had you had any uh, experience with aviation before you came to work for Avidyne? No, um, you know, other than just flying in planes as a passenger um, and not small ones. Um, so I, I don't know if you know, but it, it's um, Jake who you spoke to. Um, it, his wife is my Pilates teacher. Mary Poppins is the perfect voice, that's right. So uh, Julie Andrews and Mary Poppins is the perfect English voice, in my opinion, and that's what I was seeking in the next generation of oral alerts that we're going to use in the IFD 540. Enter Renee Bergeron, a graphic designer who does voiceover work on the side. A couple of years ago, she played a sample of that work for her brother, one of the engineers on Jacobson's team. I think a light bulb went off in his head. And he said, hey, he says, do me a favor. He says, can you say the words caution over speed in British? So uh, I went, sure, okay, nothing, all right. Caution over speed. And he's like, oh, my boss has to hear this. I don't want to be scolding the pilot, but we have to get your attention. So that's a, some nuanced um, you know, emphasis in certain parts of the, the words we were trying to record. What does your family think of your, uh, your particular role in aviation? I think they actually get a kick out of it because they always, they always joke about the bitch and Betty. 
And, uh, and so I told, I told my eldest brother, I'm like, I might be the new bitch in Betty. <laughs> I think he couldn't stop laughing for 20 minutes. It was great. Is there some specific reason why you prefer the real thing, if you will? Because we can and because it's fun. And it has a good story behind it. In Lincoln, Massachusetts, I'm Jim Moore, AOPA Live. Thank you, Jim. Well, someday it may be a two-way conversation. Jacobson said future systems will likely allow pilots to control some aircraft systems with voice commands. We all hope it works better than Siri. You can read more about the people behind the voices of today's cockpits on AOPA.org. Well, earlier in the show, we told you about the FAA charging EAA for air traffic services at AirVenture. Right or wrong, that's the FAA's response to the sequester budget problems. But now some are beginning to question whether the annual authorization and appropriation process by Congress is the best way to fund some of the FAA's functions. Are we structured nationally in a way that allows us to invest properly in this technology manage it, operate it, oversee it. And, and some, the shorthand word is privatization. The question of whether or not you want to try to go through a process of pulling some of these functions out of government and letting some sort of a entity run them separately. It is being discussed, and it probably should be, if only so we can examine what benefits might exist given the fact that we're in very different times uh, with resource constraints, uh, with a <coughs> political scenario that makes it difficult to, to understand how the funding is going to flow in the future. Well, that was Craig last week at the RTCA Symposium in Washington, D.C. RTCA is an industry advisory group to the FAA. That afternoon, the panel members agreed that what we're doing now is broken. It's a dialogue we have to have. Um, it, it didn't even start with sequestration. I mean, 23 extensions of the FAA authorization bill, partial shutdown in August or July of 11. So if we don't figure a way to, to provide secure funding and deal with the modernization things that need to take place and the ability to th make things happen sooner rather than later, then I don't think we're going to be a world leader in aviation any longer. So I think that there, there are a lot of different issues that require um, taking a hard look at, and now is a good time. This discussion needs to happen. This discussion probably, as to the best of our knowledge, is already happening among the stakeholders, the major stakeholders. Oftentimes, the Congress needs a burning platform before it will move, uh, and we are you know, approaching that burning platform through the, the continuing, continuing resolutions and the sequestrations. We've got to attack the bureaucracy now. We can talk about privatization and everything, but we got to make this bureaucracy work. Food for thought. But no matter where the discussion goes, AOPA will continue to oppose user fees, no doubt about that. You can see the full discussion on AOPALive.org. Well, as you trust AOPA to watch out for you on user fees, you can also count on AOPA for help in your medical certification needs. Now we have a new supporter in our pilot medical initiatives. Lifeline Screening has joined AOPA's list of supporting sponsors. AOPA Director of Media Relations Steve Hedges says it's a good partnership. This new partnership with Lifeline Screening is a terrific fit for us because Lifeline does health screening and it fits very well with our own work of helping AOPA members obtain medical certificates or dealing with problems uh, with their certificates when they arise. Lifeline Screening will also contribute articles and other information to AOPA.org. Well, here's a medical topic most folks don't want to talk about, especially pilots, mental illness. Chances are someone you know, maybe even yourself, is suffering from depression. Here's more from our AOPA medical advisor, Dr. Jonathan Sackier. So the joke goes, as one guy talks to his three friends, they say that mental illness strikes one in four people. I know I'm fine, so one of you losers is the likely target. No such luck. Mental illness does not respect age, gender, income, education, or any other factor. We are all at risk. The social stigma is still enormous. Some ill-informed people maintaining that this is not a proper illness, and why don't you just snap out of it? We've all had periods of time in our lives when we feel sad, 
have problems falling asleep and are distracted, maybe due to family issues, trouble at work, or the loss of a loved one. That is reasonably described as a reactive depression. There's a palpable cause that one can see and touch. As soon as that cause is addressed, recovery and return to normal is possible. But that's not what I'm addressing here. True depression is no laughing matter and can strike anyone. Characterized by some symptoms fairly close to those in reactive depression, but with subtle differences, such as instead of having trouble falling asleep, one tends to wake early. There's no tangible cause that can be blamed for feeling sad, and thoughts of suicide or other self-harm may intrude. Once one has been identified as depressed, often taken to a doctor by a concerned partner, treatment is available and with very good results. So I've said that depression spares no one, and that includes pilots. Although various authorities allowed pilots to fly while on antidepressant medications, FAA was not so keen to allow medical certification. Until April the 5th, 2010, due to some sterling work by AOPA and other groups, and in the face of evidence that this was in everyone's best interests, FAA updated their position. Now, GA pilots living with a diagnosis of mild to moderate depression, whose disease is controlled with various drugs, Prozac, Zoloft, Selexa or Lexapro and their generic equivalents, may be eligible for a special issuance. These drugs belong to a class called SSRIs, which stands for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitors. Basically, they enable serotonin produced in the brain to hang around as there may be a deficit of this messenger chemical in the brain of those living with depression. This is a situation where AOPA's pilot protection services can be so helpful, making sure one puts together the application to FAA in the proper manner. A pilot who has accepted that they have a problem, sought help, and reached a state of normalcy with medication should be able to fly, and pilot protection services helps them do just that. So forget the stigma, and if you or someone you know is feeling perpetually blue, help them get back into the blue yonder, see your doctor, and get treated. Thank you, Jonathan, the important information. Well, that's our show for this week. We hope to see you back here again next Thursday. We'll leave you this week with shots of the Santa Fe Municipal Airport in New Mexico. For Tom Haynes in his undisclosed location, I'm Warren Morningstar. Thanks for watching.